Hello and thank you for joining us for this webinar discussion on delivering healthy streetscapes, enabling accessible curbside for last mile deliveries. We're going to be here with you for a maximum of an hour and a half. We'll be uh, chatting to you, but I promise we will finish by midday at the very latest for you. And I can promise that we're going to have a really interesting uh, discussion over the next uh, 90 minutes minutes or so with some uh, very, very knowledgeable panellists. So let's meet those now, shall we? Uh, first of all, um, I don't know who that young chap is uh, at the top left, but uh, that I think used to be me. Um, I really ought to update it, but you can understand why I'm probably reluctant to do so. My name's Paul Hutton. I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar. I'm a co-owner of the website highwaysnews.com um, and uh, various other things. I do as well, including the communications for the UK's Intelligent Transport Society. Uh, we also have Ben Pierce, who is Portfolio Manager Health Effect of air pollution on uh, impact on urban health. Your, Laura Jacqueline from Grid Smarter City, she's senior relationship manager, and Paul McCormack, founder and CEO of Infinium, Infinium Logistics. So let's meet uh, those panelists if they want to put their uh, cameras on their screens as well and, uh, and join us and we will um, move on and start uh, setting the scene for today's discussions. So uh, basically today, what we did is we spoke to Sunil Budeo, who is at Coventry City Council. Now, unfortunately, he couldn't join us live for today's uh, discussions, but we thought we would uh, uh, just have a chat with him first so he could set the scene on the challenge from a local authority's point of view as to what's um, happening on those and the challenges. In, in the prior to the uh, pandemic uh, for the past two years we were still having issues with the management of the uh, curbside and, and the deliveries but they weren't as bad as uh, it's happened through the pandemic period because people have now got used to having parcels delivered at home, shopping delivered at home, and that curb space has now become a prime position. What it does for the council is actually really, really make our streets and roads very, very congested. And also it doesn't, for health and safety reasons, it, it's just increasing that pollution. But the safety reasons, you know, and they'll pull up anywhere uh, because they are delivering and they're not there for long. So, so the enforcement becomes very, very difficult for us. That's the, the challenges the council are currently facing. So, you know, how, how do we address that uh, is, is probably what the city council is trying to consider. Uh, you know, do we have additional loading bays? Do we turn around and find different ways of having these deliveries? Uh, managed, uh, you know, th th they're the sort of questions we're asking. You've got Amazon who have one delivery, probably to that one address, but that same address might have a de delivery from Asda's or Sainsbury's, or uh, going further, you might have uh, the, uh, Boohoo uh, with another parcel, DHL with another parcel. So all of a sudden, because that number of, or the uh, use of delivery has increased immensely, we're not just talking about one vehicle, we're talking about multiple vehicles, probably at the same location throughout the day at various times. And that's what's creating the congestions. We mentioned about Uber drivers or taxis, the, the taxi trade in, in the cities, the official black cab, uh, so to speak, trade is declining because the uptake of, of Uber, who will just float around at the nearest uh, pickup point or, or a high pickup point, for example, at a station. So the congestion that's created and the inconvenience that's created for the people living around those becomes untenable. And they're the sort of examples that we're having to deal with and we're looking for answers as to how, how we do that. So, so the curbside management has become uh, a challenge in itself. And uh, the, you know, using technology is where we want to try and see if we can make uh, make make those uh, curbsides available. 
So there you go. That's the thoughts of Sunil from Coventry City Council. He set his challenges. We asked you uh, when you signed up to set yours as well. And so you'll see this uh, sort of word map of uh, outcomes, the, the, the problems that you're facing, the challenges you're facing. But let's first of all bring in uh, Paul McCormack, who's from Infinium Logistics. Paul, um, explain to me the challenges that you face um, as a business from uh, difficulties at the curbside? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I suppose a brief my background is very much in final mile logistics, so this is very apt and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I, I think um, I can't disagree with any of the points that Sunnels just, uh, just called out. I think the only thing I would I suppose say is I was at an event earlier this week where we were actually trying to decipher um, and define what actually the curbside is. Uh, so I think we we probably should start there in terms of understanding, you know, we're we talking about tree-lined avenues or versus, you know, a very busy commercial street. Um, and actually, I think also differentiate between the different types of deliveries. We've got services deliveries. We've got, yes, parcel deliveries. We've got, you know, beer deliveries. We've got a whole range. Um, we've also got to bear in mind accessibility in terms of pedestrianized areas and in terms of you know people who may be disabled or blind you know and, and these things are, are all factors that need to be brought into it i suppose from my business perspective is we're also looking at how we can build technological solutions and also how we engage with the transition to ev because i think that's another one of these um points that are raised here so as we go forward just even the parking challenges that we have today is going to be overlaid with how do I actually um, park or how do I how do I book and, and how do I get an EV space? And, 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 and I suppose one of the things I often kind of consider is that, you know, if I was actually going into a, if I was going to look for a hotel now, I would never consider just turning up on the day. And I think what we're also going to see is the technological point of view. I'm going into a city. We're going to use technology to book that in advance, whether I'm doing that as an individual or whether I'm using that as a uh, as a business. And my final point being, I'll, I'll, I'll not take up everyone's time here, but I, I think the other piece here is about how we also integrate mobility as a service. You know, so we talk about deliveries. One of the biggest challenges out there at the moment is actually getting access to drivers. So where are these drivers coming from? Where do they park themselves if they're actually going to pick up a vehicle to deliver? And then it's also the different types of delivery vehicles. We're seeing a growth of queue commerce as well. So... Uh, and I think anybody who hasn't seen it yet, you'll see the rise of cargo bikes, um, uh, e-scooter deliveries, walkers, all these things that people will have a view on. I see them as a benefit. But again, it needs to be managed because at the moment there's no real regulation about how these services are used. So that's probably a broad range of kind of thoughts on us. And I'll just pause there and see if that is uh, if, if that helps. OK, thank you very much, Paul. We'll come back to you in a minute. And that was fascinating stuff. I've been scribbling down loads and notes already. Um, let's bring in Laura, because I'd like Laura to almost rewind to the very beginning and define the, the issue that we're facing in as much as the, the curbside um, people, how, how they're using it and what the current system is and the problems created by it, please. Oh, wow. So I'm not going to take up everyone's time. But yeah, my background is very much in talking to businesses, freight, logistics, um, working a lot on the high streets as well. Um, and I would say currently what's happening is it's a very ad hoc process of how people turn up. Um, I think the amount of different councils there are in the UK, everyone has a different view of curbside management. And I think, as Paul said, you know, there's the high street commercial view of curbside and there's also residential. And in the last two years, we've really seen that switch and we're starting to see businesses come back and flourish in the high streets. But there's also still online deliveries happening in the residential areas. There is... Um, I think issues with congestion in the morning in certain of these areas, there are lots of places that are now becoming pedestrianized as well, um, which is great, you know, we want people to be walking around more and cycling more and that infrastructure to be there. But there is still a need for space for those businesses to keep flourishing, getting their deliveries, getting servicing vehicles in. And it's how do we make sure that happens in the future and, in, and is safeguarded as well when all of it, all of the infrastructure is changing. And I would say that 
there needs to be a little bit more of a real time view of this. I was um, on Tuesday, I was actually in a pedestrianised area um, looking at some deliveries being made. And when you go into a business and you ask them about their deliveries, they might forget that they're getting a plumber come in that morning. So there is an extra vehicle coming to that site. And it's, it's very difficult to manage and also to know what's happening in the real time. So I'd say at the moment it's very ad hoc and I think there's a better way of monitoring that um, and managing the behaviours that are coming into that street. Okay, we'll come back to um, ideas and solutions in a moment. But then um, we've talked about the challenges for the local authority. We've talked about the challenges for the actual logistics operators. But actually, there's a wider societal problem caused by uh, the mess that is the way that uh, the curbs are used at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So I'm presuming, Paul, that you're ho hoping I'm going to talk a bit about air pollution. Um, I'm, a, I'm a portfolio manager at uh, uh, Impacts on Urban Health. So we're, we're a funder based in South London and we're focused on trying to tackle and address some of the really kind of complex um, health issues that are affecting people's lives in, in South London, but also likely in, in the rest of London and other urban settings as well. And also those issues where inequalities are really at play. So air pollution is an area that we focused on because it's the biggest environmental cause of deaths in uh, in the UK. Um, so that means that it's causing ill health to lots of people, but it's something that's being created by humans ourselves. So it's entirely solvable and entirely fixable. So um, I suppose what we found is that um, freight, as, as Sunil mentioned, and deliveries and servicing, and, and, and as Paul uh, highlighted, it's quite broad and it probably needs a bit of a clearer definition exactly what we are talking about to move forward with it. But um, given the, the fact that the number of deliveries has increased so much um, over the past kind of 20 years, but it really accelerated during the pandemic and, and that's, that trend is continuing, that's really increasing the level of um, uh, polluting vans and vehicles on our streets that's, that's exacerbating uh, the air pollution issue. So I think um, what we're also finding is that uh, these deliveries will exacerbate health inequalities in that the people that are probably most likely um, most affected may be the ones that are getting less deliveries. The people who are most affected are probably the ones that are living on main roads where most of this traffic is happening. So it's an issue that's affecting people unequally um, and it's an issue that's um, that's you know affecting people's health in significant ways. I suppose to, 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 to kind of, because that's quite a um, stark and kind of negative uh, way to start things, to say that we there are lots of interventions and potential solutions out there, I'm sure we'll come on to that. But I think, as was mentioned earlier, focusing on kind of some of the co-benefits of improving how the curbside is managed in terms of increasing active travel, increasing safety by having less vehicles around and, and obviously reducing carbon emissions and hopefully um, costs for businesses as well. There's lots of um, co-benefits that can be delivered from, you know, reimagining how we use the cur curbside and how delivery is happening. Move on to some discussion points in a moment and we'll hear a little bit more from Sunil as well. But I, Paul, I just want to come back to you because um, in the discussions, it's it's actually reminded me of an anecdote that was told by a friend of mine that at the beginning of the pandemic, um, a lot of his work, he's a freelance consultant, dried up. Um, and so he was quietly going nuts being trapped in his house. So he actually got a job working for one of the main supermarkets in East London, delivering um, people's groceries, because obviously the the delivery hours increased, more and more people needed the deliveries, so there was a shortage of drivers. So he, he got a job and he did that for about four months. And he said that he found it completely baffling that at one point he turned up to a block of flats and there were two other vans from the same supermarket. So basically two of his colleagues had turned up and there were th therefore three of them making three separate deliveries to the exactly the same location. Is that something that's quite normal or was that out of the ordinary for uh, because of the, the, the strange times we were in? And the reason I ask is if we actually had more curbside management, would that actually lead to, for example, the supermarket then thinking a bit more carefully about how it was doing its deliveries? Um, yeah, I, I think um, 
things were very um, different during sort of COVID and I think our, our own sort of delivery expectations and, uh, you know, kind of changed uh, subtly from, from where they were previously. But an example like that really isn't good news for anybody. And I think any, any sort of logistician or um, that uh, particular retailer would, would no doubt look at that. I mean, the idea is that you want to be as efficient as possible. Now, that example would indicate that there's probably more volume and it probably just means they have to get extra vans to go to that particular area. But the idea and the ideal scenario would be you'd get as much volume on the van and, uh, and make it as efficient as possible. I think the, the bit I'd, I'd sort of um, add to that, I mean, if you wanted to go to the holy grail of deliveries, you'd have you'd have centralized consolidation points to avoid that. So you would actually put all the volume in one place. I mean, it is really utopian. Um, I mean, there's a, quite a bit of way to go with that because you've got different commercial contracts at play. You've got different, different expectations. Um, and there may even be a case of that without knowing all the details. There may have even the customers have paid a premium to actually get it done at a different time. So that when you've got specific time deliveries, um, and that's where you see with the issue around the kind of 15 minute super fast delivery, you'll see uh, all around the major cities with, uh, with companies such as Getir, Gorillas uh, and the like. Um, uh, that, that means then you will drive a lot more uh, inefficiency because you will have those companies crossing over each other. But to answer your point, I think, you know, it, that's not something that any delivery business would want to see because it sounds like it's inefficient, but it may have been just with the uh, increased volume that that may have been what drove that particular example. Okay, right. Well, we're going to go, go on now to a series of discussion points that again came from um, when people were signing up. Uh, that uh, th these were the issues that, that they came up with that we've now brought to the uh, discussion points. We will chat through these and then we will have um, some questions at the end or towards the end of this uh, discussion. Uh, could you put them in the Q&A, please? I know Zoom is one of those strange platforms that gives you both the chat and the Q&A. Um, and so what always happens is some people put stuff in the chat, some people put stuff in the Q&A, and it's difficult to, to keep going. So if you look at the bottom of your screen where it's got the Q&A, if you click on there and you can put your, your questions in there, I see Katie's already put one in. Um, and so we will come to your questions a bit later on in the discussion. But as you think of them, please pop them into the Q&A now. Um, so. Before we uh, hear from our panellists, uh, we're going to discuss the, how we ensure space is equitable for all users in, in the streetscape. This is what Sunil had to say about it. Capturing those examples becomes very difficult because, you know, as, as you say, you have to have an enforcement camera along a stretch of road where you think there's in, uh, in infringements being carried out and not necessarily, and then obviously the, the, the driver of the Uber or, or the user gets very wise to it, so they'll avoid it. So the, the way we've gathered evidence is, is uh, our offices are literally outside our railway station. And we can see uh, from, from our offices that the circulation of Uber drivers uh, and the uptake of Uber uh, usage around the station is a lot more than the black cabs. So if at peak times, we can see the congestion increasing all immensely because people have pre-booked the Uber and they're coming to collect. So you have a queue of Uber uh, vehicles literally trundling into the station and out of the station. So they, they're the examples we deal with. Now, how do, how do we address that? They're not gonna go away, but is there, is there a way uh, that we can address it? Ask the question uh, as authorities are asking now. OK, so there you go. Let's um, bring Laura back in. Um, Laura, here we go then um, in, in 30 seconds. No, slightly longer than that, but uh, something that you could spend a year talking about. How do we ensure space is equitable for all users? Um, yeah, you can spend a lot of time because actually how many users are there on the streetscape? There are plenty and it changes during the day. And I think Sunil an important point is that you know in peak hours when people are needing to travel there's lots of different ways to travel there's you know buses public transport there's also taxis but then at the same time we are seeing a huge peak hour with commuters residents we've also got you know um, ambulance services as well around so there's there's plenty of people using this space 
and, and a lot of city centres, you know, a lot of the deliveries are still be done in the morning peak. Um, and if there's traffic, that also means that they might get there later, which means that they are at a tension point with um, other users who are there normally just as part of their day. So I would say that finding a way to look at when these kind of users need that space um, as a priority would be best. Um, I think some users that we kind of forget on the streetscapes are the businesses. Um, so there are businesses that are obviously open probably nine until you know seven um they're gonna get deliveries they're gonna have um freight or servicing vehicles there how do we make sure that they're there at the most reliable time yet also not making them in an area where they're going to have lots of tension with other users such as pedestrians so I, I would say that there just needs to be a real investigation on how do we ensure that there isn't a huge amount of tension between these users. And I think the morning peak is probably one of the biggest areas that most local authorities are looking at because there is a lot of congestion and air pollution in that time. So my big thing is always to monitor and baseline what's happening. Um, and especially if there's infrastructure changes um, like parklets, which are great and more parking for cycle parking is just ensuring that infrastructure isn't taken away from other users and them not replaced in some way so that that's kind of my first point is actually monitor what is happening currently um make sure that if there are changes coming for the future that is you know infrastructure is there for all users to use at different times of the day and be flexible and dynamic in that paul um one of the issues i guess when it comes to freight and logistics is that a lot of the time when transport policy is set it's about the the movement of human beings and sometimes you could almost get the impression that um the logistics sector is is forgotten about because parcels don't vote um is that an issue or do you think that the logistics industry at the moment actually does get its fair share of the streetscape? Great question. Um, I'm probably going to be slightly biased to say probably not, um, but you'd probably expect me to say that, but I think it's it's not very well coordinated, if I'm honest, um, in terms of there's lots of disparate groups. And as I said, I think there's also a lot of focus on uh, on my own business or businesses in terms of what contracts they have, etc. So I don't think some of the actual solutions that are best for the streetscape would ordinarily be uh, immediately sort of beneficial to the, some of these companies. I mean, if I just give it just one example, we're working on it's very early stages, but one of the challenges I've been set to, it's a European city. And they said, Paul, can you help us work on a, on a, on a city arrangement whereby there's no, no trucks at all? So, uh, and what has actually been really insightful is we started to break down, um, you know, uh, basically what exactly is going into the city. So we've gone really back to first principles and it was really interesting. I don't know, I'll repeat what Laura said, there's a huge amount of different user groups, but to answer your question more specifically, I, I, I'm not sure that the transport or the, the, the logistics sector has been terribly well coordinated. But I also think, you know, you end up then because logistics business and it really has just really come to the fore. I think like most people on, on this uh, event would agree that the logistics sector has been very has been very successful during the um, during the pandemic in terms of how malleable it's been. But when you look at the growth now of expectation of customers, because this is the other part of it as well, if you're looking at the whole ecosystem, what is the expectations? You know, okay, we're seeing the death of the high street to a large extent and places are being replaced with Q commerce businesses where I can actually set up a store and I can deliver it to you with 10, 15 minutes. Um, either someone will walk, they'll go on a cargo bike, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, there's a, another piece here, which is trying to understand, okay, what's the next layer of solutions that are coming downstream? But I, I would, my personal view is it's not being terribly well coordinated to date. Uh, and some of that is for reasons where businesses are quite happy to operate independently. And I genuinely believe that the solutions longer term from an environmental point of view will be that that will have to be coordinated. What I've noticed, though, I, I remember just literally walking down the street once in this bloke was just pulled up parked on a double yellow line went out and um as he was delivering he got a ticket 
And the look on his face when he came back was almost like a shrug. And it, it looked almost like um, like it was an occupational hazard that, uh, you know, that's just what you have to live with. And it's the price of doing business. But it doesn't seem to make sense that there's that lottery as to whether or not you get a ticket. But what it means is people are just stopping wherever they like and the double yellow lines are there for a reason. Well, you do get a, a, a period, and I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you. I'm sure there's lots of people on the call will tell me for sure. I think you've got a 15 minute window in terms of where you can actually park on the double yellow line. Uh, I'm sure there's people probably going on the QA saying you don't know what you're talking about, and maybe I don't on this one. But I think there's two things I would say is that you know, and it is a challenge for all the major businesses, particularly those with employees, you know, that is a a, a massive amount. So I won't quote the company, but I heard at the event I was at on Monday that. There's an organization that's being charged 10 million pounds and they're using a million pounds as an organization that actually has a team that costs them a million pounds in overhead to manage that. Um, my experience of dealing a lot with the with the gig economy um, uh, and, and sort of self-employed drivers, there are organizations that would be quite happy for their drivers to get a fine because they charge them penalties on top of it. It's a bit of an industry that sits underneath that that allows individuals an opportunity to um, or organizations can kind of charge to that and make some revenue out of it i'm not condoning that by the way so i think there's there's different use cases without knowing exactly what the driver was but yeah i, I think if my company's picking it up do i care which is um which is not ideal and that's really where I'm jumping several steps ahead i'm sure we'll get on to is there's a, there's definitely technological advancements that could be made uh to to make that whole process so much easier Let's bring back Ben. Uh, ben, how do we ensure space is equitable for all users? Yeah, so I can I can share, I suppose, some more um, thoughts on, on general approaches to take. And I think, you know, I mentioned earlier about the fact that um, the pollu pollution that's being uh, caused by the sector is not affecting people equally and is exacerbating health inequality. So I think really the most important thing that I would like to emphasise is that it's about listening to and engaging um, the communities that are going to be affected by this. So particularly prioritising, you know, residents that are living near um, sites of potential you know, work that might be planned or areas where there are particular hotspots that are there, where there are lots of deliveries happening and engaging those residents and, and listening to them and helping them have the kind of um, agency to help shape um, and deliver um, what future solutions might be coming out in that in that space because in all likelihood they're they're the people that are going to know that area really well I, but I think it's also about engaging a couple of other groups so where where possible you know, engaging with um, the drivers and the workers in this space and again giving that listening to them and giving them some some control over based on their experience and their understanding because it will be so rich what do they think um, needs needs to be happening? And, and then I think it's about engaging the businesses themselves that are, are both making the deliveries, but but really importantly, the ones that are receiving deliveries. And, and again, trying to go to organisations that may not, on businesses that may not be traditionally part of this conversation. So for example, when thinking about the cargo bike sector, um, this is obviously a sector that's, that's going through a lot of growth and I think has huge potential. Um, but so far, it's probably touching those businesses that are focused on sustainability already. So kind of going to some of those smaller community businesses that might not know too much about um, cargo bikes and engaging them in the conversation and helping them to consider how it could support them. Because the th if, if we're seeing that big change is going to be happening over the coming um, years to decarbonize, to reduce um, pollution, then we want to make sure that essentially that that the people that are going to be affected by that in the long term have been have been listened to and have been heard and have had some kind of power to to shape um, how things move forward. Almost perfectly done there, Ben. Actually, by the fact that you've almost taken us on to the next discussion point that you can see there, which is how we accelerate the infrastructure and behaviour changes needed to support healthier streetscapes. I'm looking at the the behavioural side of things here and and again part of it is as you've just said the the education and just letting people know of the options but let's let's go back to Sunil um, when I spoke to him uh, he touched on this as well and then with a number of charge points we have deployed and we've been very fortunate that they are funding there's funding available for us to do that now we've been become a little bit more uh, astute about how we use those charge points and how we can actually manage them better. 
So we're using that curbside management technology that we've developed with other partners where we, we're working with the supply of the charger and the uh, sensors that deploy uh, in, the, in the bay, which sort of links both. So if you have a vehicle parked, for example, who is it, it is an electric vehicle and who is charging. So the sensor monitors that someone's parked up there, but it also links with the charger to say, yes, they are there and it's actually charging. So we get the feedback in both directions that yes, they have parked at eight o'clock in the morning, and, but the parking restrictions are only there for two hours. So they get a two hour charge and they stay for two hours. We've then linked it to our back office for enforcement. So if the person or the vehicle overstays more than two hours, there's a message that goes out that your vehicle is charged now and it's ready to be moved. They get a grace period. And if they don't move it in time, the enforcement officer then goes out and enforce, enforces uh, the overstay in the way, which actually helps us move the traffic uh, away from uh, preoccupied bays, but it also gives opportunity for other vehicles to use and get charged in an appropriate position. So that that's how we, we, we try to tackle uh, good use of the, the infrastructure that we're putting in. So that's you know, actually touching on electric vehicle charge points and uh, Coventry City Council are leading the uh, the implementation of public EV charge points at the curbside uh, in the country and um, they are doing a lot of very interesting things uh, that other authorities across the country are then looking at and learning from. Um, so that was an interesting uh, point there that Suna was making, Laura, about the fact that um, they, they're using technology to manage the EV points and the occupancy of them. Um, and that's just, just one example of the use of technology at the curbside, which, of course, uh, Grid Smarter Cities is, is leading on here in the UK. Yeah, so tech can play a really good way of an understanding what's happening on site. And I think it's it's clear that there is going to be a change to electrification. Um, and how does that work for the commercial sector? There is a lot of discussion currently on how that would work to get into inner cities. Would you charge outside of it? You know, how how could you be sure that there's potentially a charge point in that area as well? So technology like a platform like Grid could could make sure that if you are going to go to that end destination that you can book that space and you can charge appropriately when you're in that space so using utilizing that space to the most amount of advantage so you're delivering unloading loading at the same time as you know transitioning to electric as well so there has been hesitation in the past just to know that there's enough infrastructure to to push lots of logistics companies to to continue um, and I think that's something that tech can play a good role in because I think that real time information is really important when it comes to logistic planning. You don't want to be then circling and causing more congestion, trying to find a space to potentially charge. And I think there's another another part in this in infrastructure, not necessarily just for vehicles, but for like Ben said, there are cargo bikes in the freight world now. They are playing a part, especially in inner cities. And how do we make sure that they have appropriate space to park up deliver and then also not cause any hindrance to potentially pedestrians and cyclists or or actually access accessibility issues as well I think that's something that's come across is you know there are there are those who might need more space on the on the sidewalk or the, the pavement as such and that needs to be included in in how infrastructure is looked at so I would say tech has got a good place to play in end destination and checking that it's being used appropriately so yeah that's probably where i would i would see tech working in a real time um, monitoring and 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 baselining we'll come back to technology in a moment but in all the work that you're doing how are you finding uh behavioral change are, are people now changing their behavior and are they doing that through absolute necessity or because they're getting more options that they're then embracing and using i would say there is a lot of tension on space and i think it's it's a good tension and also a bad tension good tension on the basis that yeah people are looking at consolidation micro consolidation cargo bikes and kind of taking the traffic out of that end destination 
But then there are also logistics companies that are really thinking about, okay, instead of having 10 smaller vehicles that are going to add to congestion, I will put a larger vehicle in, I'll try and go early, early morning to avoid any kind of other pedestrian users, and I will consolidate from that vehicle. Um, you also have parcel companies looking at potentially portering, so making sure that they're parked up somewhere else in a large vehicle and then people are portering and walking around rather than staying in the traffic. Um, so I, I see there being a push. I think there's a space for every actor in this. I think there are a space for cargo bikes, but I also think there are some industries where actually consolidating in a large vehicle and then potentially, you know, delivering from that vehicle is going to be easier. I do think there is still a long way to go with consolidation hubs and micro hubs because I think the business case and the cost is, is still quite high. And I think that needs to kind of change and whether that's in planning or councils or, or policy, that, that probably does need to come across. But we're probably at a tension point now where space is going to change um, and it's going to change quite rapidly like it has in the last two years with the pandemic for a positive reason. Um, we just need to make sure that that tension between the users is not, um, I, I would say, quite explosive. And, and, and that's where we, we need to make sure that any infrastructure coming in is, is being used by all, but at certain different times of the day and making sure that there's safe environments for those who are more vulnerable users. Ben, what are your thoughts on the question? Yeah, I, I, I agree with what I was just saying there, particularly on some of the accessibility points. I was going to mention that too, but I think, I think part of it from from the infrastructure side which i suppose to some extent is trying to influence the the policy makers local authorities that have the power to make this change i think um what's useful for us to be doing is focusing on the the co-benefits of um of such changes and such infrastructure that might go in so if it's um if it's to do with you know cycle lanes for more cargo bikes then kind of looking to that that's going to reduce uh, carbon emissions that's going to have Essentially, commercial benefits for businesses because they, they could hopefully be getting deliveries for for uh, for, for, for less um, cost for lower cost, and um, it will have knock on health benefits. It will be you know taking vehicles off the road. It can be um, increasing active travel and things like that. So I think when people are looking at interventions and infrastructure changes, kind of looking at the full range of benefits that will be there and the full value that can be delivered, rather than you know looking at through a particular say departmental lens and thinking about just the value that it's going to deliver. From the, from the kind of angle that that I might have, um, so I think I agree that you know that there's as Laura said there's there's co benefits as well to be had in terms of accessibility. I think one other um, thought to say in relation to infrastructure is um, I think electric electrification and electric vehicles, electric vans have do have a role to play in 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 how we move forward in this and how we um, you know generally move to a space that is that is better for all. But I would uh, kind of, I suppose, encourage people not to see that as the panacea and that if we just switch all the vans that we have the um, internal combustion engine to electric, then that's not going to address the issue of congestion. It's not going to address the issue potentially of road safety. And electric vans also emit um, particulate matter through the tyre wear and the braking. So there's still an effect on pollution. So I think I guess it's encouraging people to think about those other solutions that are out there, like cargo bikes, like consolidation, like using the river, like using rail more. Um, and, and that just, you know, switching to electric vans, for example, won't 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 fix the problem. It will it will, um, you know, it will mean that some issues still remain. Paul, you were nodding along there um, during uh, yeah. Ben's comments. Yeah, uh, I think the guys have, have, have covered off all, all the main points. The only thing I would say is that in terms of we're seeing a different type of management of local delivery solutions, and that's I'm thinking about driver welfare here in terms of um, you've got particularly when you're offering you know fast delivery, whether that be parcel delivery, whether that be QCOM, you know, this kind of like you've got your little super, that's like a superstore, you know, a small superstore, maybe only a couple of thousand square feet. Um, or maybe it's just your standard food delivery from uh, dark kitchens, you know, which you've seen on the rise uh, across Europe, particularly. Um, you know, that where, where do the drivers stay? You know, I've, I've been dealing with council complaints saying 
we're happy for you to convert this location. And quite rightly, they're saying, well, where are, you, where are the drivers going to be? You know, if you're going to offer any logistician, we'll say, if I've got to offer a 15 minute window, then I've got to have the drivers around. So um, that that becomes a, a bigger challenge. And I've been working on a project in New York, east, east and upper east. East side and, uh, and upper west side were very residential areas where previously we were just dropping curbside deliveries. The drivers would meet and then go on. And quite rightly, they challenged and said that that just doesn't work for us. We've got, you know, and particularly since they um, they, they legalized cannabis, it's like uh, you, you get high just by being on the same street. So I think that's just something that it's just the only thing I would add to here. So I think it's great that and actually from a health point of view, actually driving a or cycling a cargo bike, you know, kind of power assisted is actually quite a cool thing um, and something I could probably do more of myself. But I think that the reality is that we just probably aren't really thinking about the overall ecosystem. And I agree with Ben. I don't think the answer is just removing vehicles completely. Um, and the only other point I said, which isn't really on the agenda today, but it's just in terms of how we measure CO2 usage. I, I get lots of people saying, hey, listen, I've saved X amount of tons of CO2. And unless I'm missing something, I don't believe there's actually anything that tells us a consistent measurement of that because you know there's lots of ways of presenting figures i think everyone's got the right intentions but i don't think that's necessarily there and i appreciate that's probably a, a separate debate completely about measurement of co2 but that would be the only additional point i would add to uh, to what the laura and ben have said yeah okay there are projects going on at the moment trying to um uh, standardize that measurement of co2 exactly for that reason across different local authorities because in, in until you can accurately measure you can't compare and you can't do anything about it so uh, so the role of technology solutions in the curbside and of course here at this point i think laura it would be helpful if you could explain the pioneering work that grid smarter cities has done in trying to to solve the challenges that we've been talking about by using the virtual world yeah, so um, Grid Smarter Cities, we have a tech platform which kind of enables the curb owner, which is mostly a landowner or, or a local authority, to manage their space whilst communicating with the curb users. And predominantly it is the logistics companies, so speaking to different sectors, so breweries would use um, the curbside much differently they have health and safety measures that they need they need to be outside of the pub near a cellar door they need roughly an hour to help for health and safety reasons to deliver properly um, and then you have parcel companies actually have a very different view of how they deliver it takes a lot less time a lot more drops so the platform enables the local authority to decide where these you know loading bays let's say or virtual bays are, are put um, and the regulation as such so 20 minutes 40 minutes and then the operator to book that in advance so a lot of the operators do have um, planning in advance anyway of where they're going to be the next day so it would then say okay well this is available for you to go and be there um, and make sure that you're not going to get um, a PCN because actually you're talking to the local authority in advance as such and saying I expect my vehicle to be there um, I know some people have brought up congestion and what if they're not able to be at that space at that time and there is a functionality on the platform to alert that you'll be late and then potentially find another option um, but it's in a way creating a communication between the operators who are using that space and those who are actually owning the space and having a kind of a more positive relationship and, and kind of also seeing um, how they can manage it. A, a lot of things that did come up were, um, you know, what if a street is closed for Healthy Streets Day? Or, you know, if there's a fun run or something like that, actually a lot of the logistics companies aren't necessarily aware that that's happening so we'll probably go to that area and then have to circle back and not make that delivery so the potential there of just reducing that kind of mileage that's not even being used and potential business disruption of the business not getting that delivery it, it would just make things a lot more efficient but also you know the local authority then gets a chance to to manage that in the way that they would like to be and you, you're talking in sort of you know, the, the suggestion that, yes, it will reduce congestion and, and everything. Do you have any actual studies that suggest that uh, there is a sort of percentage that could be achieved by properly managing the curb and stopping uh, all the, the issues that you've been talking about? 
Yeah, so we um, had a third party consultant last year, uh, Santec, do a report, which there is um, a report and a, a YouTube clip of, of kind of what that that looks like how many vehicles potentially and that was because that that project worked quite closely with the logistics companies but really understanding their necessity to be at certain areas for certain times and and being kind of closer to what the local authorities want to see as well so there is a report on that that shows um what it would look like if that was used and the space was used more efficiently so there is i will i will link the report at the end of this um webinar Thank you. And Paul, does this sound like um, the holy grail for um, a logistics company to have this ability to, to book the curb space and know it's going to be there and it's going to be there when you need it? Yeah, I think there's certainly for it. But again, I think you have to break down the different use cases. I mean, the bit that I've been most interested in just from background is the, is the kind of the final mile parcel delivery um, organizations which probably only make up about 15 percent of the four and a half million uh, light commercial vehicles out there but I think certain organizations you could set your watch by you could you know whether it be beer deliveries or even if it's your newspapers being delivered to stores which are with people like Menzies and Smith's News who are who've got dedicated slots you've got your pharmaceutical businesses that obviously have got uh, standards to meet so I think all of those are actually going to kind of find this so much easier i think when you're dealing with a more dynamic where you know uh, parcel delivery companies are cutting their volume as they would say in the morning or that late that night to decide okay what's the most efficient route you know i may start at number one green lane today but tomorrow i start at number 50 because that's where the first order was and and it rolls on from there so they're not always going to know where they're going to be so i think uh, the solution there is is about being dynamic because what if i and even for any of the even the others what happens if i'm delayed so i see very much an infrastructure where particularly when we're dealing with the ev solution as well as that i can see a world where you know i'll go down i'll, I'll enter the city it'll tell me how many bays are available that can actually be used today others are already pre-ordered but say i was due to book in at one o'clock in the afternoon I'm delayed, but then at that 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 site would then flash up to say it's available. I mean, there's nothing more frustrating whether you're, whatever vehicle you're in, if you're trying to deliver and you've got to drive up and down the same street a few times to try and get a space. Um, that that just from an environmental point of view is, is bonkers, uh, frankly. So how do we try and avoid that and guide people to the right locations? Um, and known drivers, well, you know, their behaviour will be they will drive and park as close to where they want to deliver as possible as opposed you know and i'll take a fine if it needs to be because i'm incentivized in terms of delivering either a parcel rate or i'm incentivized uh to um uh to 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 sort of you know i've got a day rate so i win if you want to call it that by finishing early so i think there's some behavioral stuff there that sits behind it i think there's ways that we can work with logistics companies to try and make that less about just kind of getting rid of the parcel as quick as possible um so yeah i, I but but the technology piece for me i'd answer your question yes i think there's advantages of being able to book it, but I think it also needs to be uh, dynamic because that's the nature of uh, of what we're uh, what we're dealing with. And Ben, I've seen you nodding away there. Yeah, no, just primarily agreeing with with what Laura and Paul said. I, I, I think the only thing I might add is that um, I suppose the role of kind of technology and information in the public realm that that may be useful for uh you know delivery drivers to know what's been booked and for other businesses and other drivers to know whether a space is available or not that 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 um you know that information that that kind of presentation of information can be used to potentially show other information as well so this could be on for example and we've heard so we've heard from residents that you know they would value information on what's the air pollution levels like at the moment potentially in the right context but also with um, you know, say like a QR code that enables them to go somewhere to find out more information like what would be a cleaner route for me to take what can I do to reduce my exposure and things like that but also that I think um, that kind of uh, technology being used to display information in the public realm can can also be looking at wider things and again it's about kind of engaging the local residents local businesses what information would be useful to be sharing in quite a dynamic way so if something's happening at the weekend there's a there's, a, there's an event that's happening in that space that, that can be promoted um, if there's a you know a consultation that, that people would like other people to engage in, that that can be done so that it can kind of help build a sense of community, build engagement, um, and that kind of technology has a role role to play there. In addition to what Laura and Paul have said, 
just okay. I just wanted to um, also point out, I know we're talking a lot about deliveries at the moment, but um, there is a huge sector, the service sector, you know, um, if anyone's getting an installation of internet, let's face it, most of us have, if we've moved house, you know, there are a lot of curb users, it's not necessarily just the delivery sector, there are carers that are also going around lots of places, you know, there are, I was at an uh, event this week, there's, you know, NHS Trust have a huge fleet, um, there are a lot of people just using um, the curbside and it's understanding their needs how long do they need to be there um, and also um, in that event they were talking about different types of vehicles that they could use um, and how can they safely park maybe an e-bike and um, I know that some people have mentioned e-bikes or, or e-mobility um, it, it's getting ready for that future infrastructure that's going to come but also making sure that there is space to prioritize that and it, it's a safe place for them to park up so there are I know we're talking a lot about logistics here but there are a lot of users in that space um, whether that's utilities or, or others moving house scaffolding um, construction I know a lot of people talked about that but that means that the space is being used for lots of different uses um, creating you know a lot of congestion potentially if there's better ways to manage that that is is going to help most other users as well as just let's say the delivery users um can i just throw something in that i just want to see is it being considered which is that i think of when i use my phone for just parking uh, either in a car park or on a on, you know in a space on a street um, you, I, I must have about five or six different apps on my phone, depending on which of the parking companies has got the contract with the local authority. Is there any thought in any way we can start to look at interoperability or just, you know, avoiding that when it comes to this? Because that surely will in accelerate the, the take up of it if everyone can use the same bit of kit. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a big focus on policy currently on curbside management. A lot of um, local authorities have been doing a lot on freight, um, transport, public realm, and because all of the all of those teams have been focusing on that, they're starting to realise that the curbside management needs to be part of that aspect. So I think on a wider scale, I do think government are, are looking at this and seeing that it's going to be an area that needs to be managed. Um, so. I would expect that it's going to come potentially through policy as well as just um, different councils doing that. But yeah, it would be better to have one platform than than loads, and especially for an operator, a, list, a logistics operator who might not see the boundaries between councils. So having lots of different things to remember, and a lot of the dri drivers, you know, won't always know what time they need to be somewhere um whether it's seven to eleven seven to eight seven seven um so you have to look out for the street signage that having something that's a little bit more digital and that they can kind of plan ahead would be a lot easier for them than having potentially 30 different ways to do that so yeah we, we would want it to be more simplified so that it's not causing more work okay um, let's move on because let's because uh, believe it or not we've nearly been talking an hour already and it's flown by and so the next half an hour will fly by too um, and let's talk about sort of what we can do now to make a difference in the next two to five years because uh, otherwise you know we're very good um, in intelligent transport to spend a lot of time discussing things a long way away without actually you know necessarily realizing that there's that there are things you can do here and now so uh, let's hear again from Sunil when we talked about the short-term strategies at the moment and how you know the question uh, we, we're all as an authority are asking how do we manage now the way we feel and as as commentary have always been quite a lead in innovation we've deployed uh, over uh, 800 sensors in the city center now uh, which monitors all the parking bays that are available but again the infrastructure that we're putting in for autonomous vehicles to operate that's what's going to really help us manage that curbside space manage the, the data we we've also working with the company to monitor using our normal cctv where we feel those congestions so it, it starts uh, identifying and collecting data as to what type of vehicle is using that road space uh, so using 
uh, AIs and uh, 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 the intelligence within the uh, data collection team uh, is where we are then able to actually uh, gauge where we need to enforce, where we can focus on enforcing and how we can use that uh, the developed technology or, or ever evolving technology uh, for connected and autonomous vehicles to operate because that will help us try and reduce that uh, level of congestion that has been created. Okay, so uh, and again the, the mention of connected and autonomous vehicles there and that's a uh, one of my bugbears is the fact that people tend to group the two together and autonomous vehicles are still or fully autonomous vehicles still uh, a good way away in a lot of cases uh, connected vehicles are here and now and we need to be i believe maximizing the the value of um uh, of connectivity uh, much more than we we are at the moment but um uh, let's start with you, Ben. What do you think we can do in the short term to uh, to then implement um, uh, solutions that can can make a real difference? Yeah, so I think we're seeing that there's there is lots of uh, potential solutions in this space that that we can already be using and harnessing. So um, not necessarily in order of priority, but I think we. We funded a couple of projects that are looking at the scaling up of cargo bikes for businesses. I know it's been mentioned before, but um, so how can we support uh, local businesses in uh, around, particularly the project we funded is around the London Bridge area to um, switch from their um, uh, their deliveries to using cargo bikes. Be that that they're um, working with um, their existing delivery organisations, their existing career, and encouraging them to, to switch to cargo bikes or acquiring their own bike for their own deliveries to be made. And I think we're seeing that there's huge potential there, both in terms of um, reducing costs and reducing emissions. So particularly for businesses that are prioritizing sustainability, it makes a huge amount of sense. But I think, again, as I said, it's about working with that broader set of businesses that are out there that could benefit to understand what their priorities are and how they can be supported to make that switch. So that's, that's a big one, but I think we're also exploring how can we make more use of, um, again, another asset that's been used for deliveries over the years in London, which is the river. So how can we use how can we use um, how can we use boats to make deliveries into the centre of, of London and then from there delivering onwards with either vans, electric assisted vehicles or, or cargo bikes? Um, how can we use rail? So passenger trains um, and other trains, which where we're seeing obviously usage has dropped significantly post pandemic. Those, but there's still space there that can be used to, to potentially make deliveries as well. And then thinking about um, kind of the click and, click and collect and parcel drop off sector. So I think as with um, as was mentioned earlier, that's probably a space as well where there's potentially from a consumer perspective, it's not working very efficiently and it's not very clear who's making your deliveries, where are they going? Am I picking them up? Are they coming to my door? And I think working with both parcel uh, operators and um, uh, people that are benefiting from deliveries, so you, I, and all the people on the call, to think about how can we create a system that kind of incentivizes parcel drop-offs and enables people to pick up their parcels and their deliveries as part of their daily routine that they might be on, rather than you know vans and, and other vehicles going door to door. I think that can have a role to play. Consolidation as well, I think, is a challenging one, but I think it does have a role. And I think with all of those things, we're kind of seeing that there's huge potential to reduce reduce emissions, reduce pollution, and potentially reduce cost. The issue around cost, I think, is that a lot of these things may not stack up against the you know the incumbent solution of, of, of using vans at small scale. So it's how can we enable these these interventions to reach a kind of scale that enables them to compete. Um, and so I think what we're doing with all of those projects that we funded is evaluating them and kind of learning what what are the challenges in terms of developing this at scale in London and then in other cities and urban settings as well. Um, yeah, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and can we share that with, with others? Um, so I think yes, yeah, th those are some of the some of the short term strategies that can be implemented. Oh. Yeah, I think the, it's some some great points raised there. I think the only other couple of things I would add to it, uh, I, I agree the consolidation uh, is is a challenge. I think that's ultimately where we'll get to. And I'm actually even seeing now examples of whereby organisations who would classify themselves as probably sworn enemies are now starting to look at actually we're going down the same street. 
you know, to to meet our commitments to our clients, we, we probably can and should work together. Now, some of that's driven by the fact that costs have gone up, which, you know, I was reading somewhere recently that uh, to get a container from China now is probably about 15 times more expensive than in what it was uh, 18 months ago. So I think that whole supply chain is actually starting to be challenged. So I think we are seeing a shift towards um, organizations sharing, um, which, you know, so I don't want to repeat the comments that were raised already. I would just point out, I think it did come up in one of the comments, I think our notes somewhere is uh, is about, you know, kind of lockers and, and those pick up and drop off points, I think are super helpful. Um, and I see some some great tech around the world, you know, where you've got like agnostic drop off points and they're different to your standard lockers where you've pretty much got a single bay or single door, if you will. It is effectively like a robotic vending machine, if you will, and you just basically put in you basically put in your items into that. So I think those uh, be them becoming more agnostic rather than having all of your different sort of carriers trying to fight over the same space. And when we're talking about managing the streets, I think, you know, that actually does provide a public service and to people who are residents nearby. Why not actually accept having that? Trying to get planning permission for for lockers on the street is uh, is pretty difficult. Um, and I think that actually is something that we can look at. And then the other thing I'll just say is in terms of what I think strategies, some of the basic ones, just like sharing best practice, been some great things we've touched on today and even Sunil has come out. I'm not sure how widely they are publicised. And I think there's that many groups. I'm actually, I'm not sure. I'm even up to date in terms of exactly who's doing what to who. So I think the sharing of best practice. And then also I think looking at, and I know this is probably something Laura and, and that team are doing is starting to look at things in terms of a, a grid or sector, because you know what you supply on, as I said, on a tree-lined avenue, uh, maybe beside a river is very different to what you're going to present in a city centre. And then also from a council planning point of view, because I've got various applications out there to repurpose space in London alone uh, for, for uh, delivery purposes. Um, uh, I'm happy to share that. And I'm, it's about kind of looking at things holistically, because if I was to put in a, a kind of a, an urban logistics delivery hub, you know, then obviously it has an effect I think positive, but you know, some might argue, but it's about how do we bring all that information to the to the fore. So probably not in terms of really like technological advancements per se, but more about information sharing and understanding what 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 direction we're we're traveling here. Okay, let me just uh, I'm going to read out a comment from uh, Neil Heron, who's the founder of Grid Smarter Cities, that then Laura can expand upon. But I've just uh, seen this pop up in the chat. Uh, the approach by Grid is one of understanding the operator needs and enabling a digital pre-approved waiver system and allowing the local authority to determine the prioritization hierarchy, spatially, temporally and by vehicle type. The Curb Solution suite can include bookable permit bays, more suitable for larger HGV location, critical deliveries, rather than first come first served as present. Zonal permits, more appropriate for parcel type deliveries where slots are not booked but dwell allowed on. Uh, SYL and DYLs where loading is already permitted but time limited, subject to agreeing operating protocols. And if a permit bay is occupied by a rogue vehicle, then there's the option to spin up a pre-approved alternative loading option whilst the non-permitted vehicle is enforced against. So. This all sounds great, Laura. Um, how much is it happening and how quickly could it be expanded? Um, well, it can it can happen quite quickly. We have some projects coming and, and, and that's going to look at, you know, more the bookable side, but actually virtual is, is easy to happen quite soon. You have to talk to the, obviously, the landowner and agree those kind of priorities of what they have, but it, it happens very quickly. The space is there. It's just how do you want to manage it? Um, so the tech is there and also with tech i think the good thing is that it can constantly evolve so as as neil has mentioned it doesn't necessarily mean you just have one bookable bay you know there are other options and the point of grid is that it won't just stagnate in what's happening right now we are looking at what happens in two to five years you know autonomous vehicles are going to come parcel lockers are going to be part of part of the system and the ecosystem will also have cargo bikes and cargo bikes need to be involved in that whole process as well you know they have a space they need to to be sure that they can use it in the right way um so tech constantly evolves and that's the point is that if you have something that can evolve you can change when you know things are changing very flexibly and i think the next two to five years it's also looking at the the benefits that 
booking a curbside can be. It's not necessarily just for um, the driver. The driver's health could be a lot better. The air quality can be a lot better. But all of these co-benefits help a lot of the different council teams as well. So everyone is looking at the curb because they have different priorities. Construction can sometimes happen on the curb. And actually, how do you get those council teams to all find a benefit from that? And how they could do that by having a platform that manages that and then they can change it how they want to change it. So I would say that tech could allow lots of different actors that previously not in that conversation to be more part of the curbside management. And I think something that ha Ben did mention is communities. I don't feel that communities, local communities have much of a say sometimes in those things. And that can sometimes prevent a project from going further. You know, they are part of that environment. They need to know what's going on and they also need to have a say as such, but also so are the ones who are delivering to that area and so are the businesses. So it's, things can be challenged if you don't start with every actor being involved at the first place. I know that that means that there are a lot of people in a conversation and it can take a little bit longer, but actually you can then find out all the challenges so that two, five, two to three years down the line, you're not having someone go, well, I wasn't involved in that conversation. So it's about, it's about bringing in private and public sector together and finding in a more efficient way of doing this because everyone wants a better curbside everyone wants better air quality and it can actually have lots of benefits for everyone okay so the final question you can see there um at the bottom uh how do we bring together an innovative collaborative approach with problem owners and solution providers i.e how do we get those conversations going on how do we deal with potentially multiple different departments within a local authority? How do they take a holistic uh, view of this? Um, you guys are the experts. Um, what do you think? It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a hard start, but actually I think that if you can really sit down and have discussions of what their future plans are and find something that has a synergy between all of them, um, it can work but I also think working with you know Ben and Paul it's it's the fact that you can bring more than one solution if you can integrate more than one solution that helps a lot of different teams rather than them having lots of different options so I think tech can play a role in in making it actually a little bit more streamlined for a lot of those council organizations and and teams because you want them all working together because it's the same space that they all own isn't it Cool. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think the the other piece to that is that I, I think there does need to be a lot better in terms of information sharing and actually segmenting areas and understanding. As I said, there's such a difference. You've got certain localities that actually have, you know, multiple occupancy, maybe limited services nearby. You know, could that be, you know, if you go to the kind of Polish model where you have a lot of, you know, pick up and drop off points with lockers on the outside you've got actually they're, they're nearly as, the same as the size of a small depot you might see here and I think it came up in one of the chats or comments you know could we could we see more of that uh, you know some of the space being reutilized for uh, for pick up and drop off points absolutely um, retailers will obviously want click and collect going into their stores that also makes perfect sense I think the, the, the headlines to me really as I said earlier I think it's about you know there's some really great stuff going on but it is about sharing not just best practice, but also the direction of travel. Some, I don't know, I, I'll apologise, I have probably focused more on the standard or the, the parcel logistics sector. Uh, but even in that world, you'll have some organisations thinking, now I'm not so sure I like the whole idea of cargo bikes. I think I'm still going to have my depots on the outskirts of cities and going in with larger electric vehicles, that ticks that box. And then you've got others who are saying, no, no, I'll bring a large articulated vehicle, I'll drop it off, use a tail lift, roll cages into a consolidation center and then put those bags on cargo bikes. I'm not saying one is either right or wrong. They both have their benefits, but it's about sharing that sort of that sort of pack. So I, I just see a, a sense of segmenting areas and what one solution will work in one may not in another. Um, but I think it's about how we how we break that down and having a, a pilot and and and, uh, and and looking at, you know, particularly from that sort of delivery sector, what would that look like? What does good look like? And and that's something I'm starting to kind of uh, to get a lot closer to. 
And Ben, you must have come across collaboration in other aspects. Um, any lessons there that we can learn uh, in this case? Um, well, I think I think it probably comes back to some of those kind of classic elements of, of, of what good collaboration looks like and kind of having a shared vision. So I think as a starting point, so I think with this, it's kind of thinking, being hopeful and optimistic and understanding that um, this is a problem or a kind of area that is solvable and that what that would look like in the future, like a curbside, you know, basically, you know, to some extent the picture you've got here, particularly the right hand side of it, where actually if we reimagine what the curbside looks like, that can have so many multiple benefits for communities, for businesses um, and, and for workers as well. So I think trying to get people on board with being hopeful and, and optimistic about what the future can look like, whilst also understanding that there are so many things that can be being done now. Um, I think then also it's, as we've spoken about earlier, trying to get some of those businesses that may traditionally see each other as competitors um, to work together towards this, because, you know, we're talking about one aspect of this is the climate emergency and another aspect is air pollution. These are both issues that are affecting people's health now and in, and and will do significantly in the medium and long term and so i think you know we need to be kind of realistic and pragmatic about the the the, the kind of being competitive and trying to be overly protective about certain aspects of, a, of, a, of an approach need to be kind of potentially reconsidered and i think that on say parcel drop-offs and lockers and deliveries that, that from a consumer perspective how can we make it work best for consumers whilst also um, focusing on reducing reducing emissions and I think probably the other thing to say is that some of the things we have seen that work really well is um, working with organizations who can engage communities and residents to discuss this issue so we've worked a lot with community research organizations the likes of um, organizations called the social innovation partnership centric clearview and some of our partners that we have who are experts at engaging, um, for example, black and minoritized residents in lower income communities and areas of, of deprivation, li listening to them to understand what are their priorities in a more broad sense, and then trying to think about, well, given these issues here that, that we've outlined uh, today, um, what do you think about that? How does that connect to some of your priorities? What role would you, what do you think needs to happen and what role would you want to play in that? So I think it's kind of, I suppose, broadening the conversation out to people um, because um, that, that will lead to more equitable solutions, it will lead to better solutions, it will lead to more impact at scale um, in, in the long term as well. Fantastic, thank you. Let's, uh, right, a reminder, if you could put your questions in the Q&A, please. I know there have been comments flying around in the chat as well, but if you've got specific questions for the panel, throw them into uh, the Q&A. And what we'll do here, panel, is I'm not gonna choose which one of you uh, should answer this so just kind of give a little wave or something and uh, um, and then we'll know uh, who's going to speak first so um, Sandra asks what's the sp sweet spot in terms of delivery type and time for reserving a parking space if a driver has multiple deliveries per day that are each only a few minutes long it seems impractical for them to reserve a space with congestion, there's no way they'll actually be able to make the reservation in time. So what type of delivery is best for reserving a space at the curb? I guess that's probably gonna be used starting with this one, Laura. Yeah, so I'd say those who are gonna be at the curbside for, for, for a longer time period. So I think like brewery, food deliveries, um, I'm talking about the larger ones there that are potentially consolidating. I saw um, a Zenith, um, lorry that does kind of um laundry and other things um park up and you know they were there for probably about 40 minutes but on the street they they probably were delivering to about five of the businesses so even though they came with a large lorry they were consolidating that to make sure there weren't less smaller lorries coming um so i would say it's definitely the large lorries with health and safety um issues that would be booking it um and as um, neil has mentioned you know something more like a, a digital zonal permit for parcels would make more sense to the way that they work so there's a lot of work going on with the type of deliveries also servicing um, vehicles, so uh, potentially Virgin Media, BT, um, Thames Water, where they know that they're going to be doing work for, for longer than an hour for health and safety reasons, that is probably more a likelihood that they, they would want to use that. So 
it's definitely the larger time frames that we think and for health and safety risk assessments as well that that would make it more sensible okay um ben or paul do you want to pick up or should we move on uh, i just uh, i'd agree with that the only thing i would say is that i think based on the size of some of the cargo bikes that are kind of hidden in the streets i mean some of these are actually nearly as expensive as a small car you could probably pay 15,000 for for some of the more robust models um and some actually have trailers behind them as well so uh it's just something we're starting to become more cognizant of yes you can put them into car parks and we can get spaces in there certainly in the subterranean car parks kind of it fits quite nicely and you could actually kind of have a consolidation center there as well however i'm just flagging it that and it's something that was came up with a session earlier this week just on this just the, the sheer size of them we, we need to start thinking slightly differently because just leaving them on the curb uh, and and we know what e-scooters can look like then then that that becomes a, that becomes an issue that's the only point i would add to that okay um beth has asked at a government level does there need to be an in fact can there be some kind of tax on deliveries with the aim of stopping in inverted commas free delivery for consumers um people order frequently online because you know amazon will deliver free so they'll do multiple um orders in a week i mean to be honest i when i i live out in the sticks so i use amazon quite a lot because it's convenient from compared to going 15 miles to my nearest town and i can order one order and get four or five uh, come in four or five different deliveries it doesn't necessarily all come in one because you order it in one but you know, is there um, a need to actually incentivize the delivery companies to change their behavior or is another tax or government intervention, Paul, the last thing that the industry needs or wants? I think it's a brilliant question. I actually don't know whether, I think there's so many different levels to it. There's even the concept of free delivery. Um, so it's, if you're paying for it, if you're certainly a prime member for Amazon and I think it's where I see the benefit, though, is I would look at um, and I can see more companies doing it now as they're flagging, you know, what efficient, how efficient this delivery was. So they start to categorize your delivery options. So I think what we'll see is actually if you um, and this does take a little bit of work from a from a planning point of view. But if you took your delivery on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then actually there'll be no charge to that if you want it on a different day. Because actually that's, we don't have to, in the area, and I'm actually talking to some people in Canada about this at the minute, just in terms of the, the scale of the country. So it may not be immediately visible here to think, oh, we're going to move to that. But I think we're kind of got that cost versus service kind of challenge. So to answer the question, I think, you know, the government will probably be quite reluctant to get involved into, you know, consumer behaviour at this stage. I think they will uh, eventually. But I, I do see more and more now where, if I'm ordering frequently, um, then I'm getting a flag to say, actually, if you had this delivered to a parcel locker, then that actually would be a more efficient way of doing it. I see that slightly maybe more than than sort of a blanket tax, albeit I, I could be wildly wrong on that. It wouldn't be the first time. And uh, Ruth's asked an interesting question, which is, has anyone actually looked at how it's working in uh, the Netherlands, where many places are pedestrianised, or even Glasgow or Liverpool, which has time deliveries in main streets? This is for sort of shop food deliveries. But, you know, what, what are they doing elsewhere in the world that we could learn from and use? Or is, is a lot of what we're talking about here pioneering in the UK? I just come in quickly, Paul, on the previous question. Just to... Oh, sorry, yeah. A couple of points. So, so I think one thing to bear in mind is that you know we're living now in in a in a in a period of probably a prolonged period of a cost of living crisis. So I think increasing costs for consumers needs to be kind of we need to be bearing that wider factor in mind. I know I said that probably the majority of deliveries probably are happening disproportionately by people that are least affected by the cost of living crisis, but I think that needs to be considered. And I think um, I think there are, but there are I, I totally agree with what Paul said. I think there's probably innovative ideas out there. Um, for example, we know that you know, the cargo bike sector, which is growing, it's growing in the right way. So it's employing people in, on fair contracts. It's paying people at least London living wage. We know that in the gig economy sector, it's competing against. That's not the case. So the cost that is being, um, so some of the costs that uh, the gig that the gig economy sector kind of has outside of what they're paying their their staff 
is being kind of externalized into the into the environment by polluting more and the fact that you know, those workers through being paid inadequately will have a lot a series of knock-on kind of potential health effects off the back of that so i, th I think there's a, there's some things to think about there but kind of being being mindful on those wider factors but i'll let others come in on, on the question that just asked if you want to make those points you might just um come in on the on the pedestrianization point on that question um so yes there is there is a lot more work i think in in the netherlands i would say the population are potentially more engaged with with the kind of future plan of pedestrianization and, and what that is and there is a lot of government support in that which i think is is brilliant really and that really helps to push pedestrianization in places there are time deliveries in a lot of main streets in London and the UK, as you as you've mentioned. It does mean, though, that some of these timed places, um, as such, I was one. I was there this, on Tuesday um, between seven and eleven. Those timed timed areas are very busy um, and busy in a peak peak hour of commuting, busy with large vehicles and you know by 11 o'clock it's brilliant because you've got tables and chairs outside, it's al fresco but it does mean that there's no vehicle access after that so if a pub had a, an issue and needed servicing that that can be an issue but then also it means that vehicles are potentially parking up somewhere else and causing congestion somewhere else so I know there has been um, ideas of doing nighttime deliveries um, that is something that is I think needs more discussion on. Um, there is obviously residents in some of these areas. They need to be involved in that conversation. But I do think a lot of the logistics sector would love to do early morning deliveries and, you know, not be there in, in any kind of peak hour with cyclists or pedestrians because it's, it's a lot more efficient for them. It's a lot less stressful as well because the more actors you have in a street, it can actually be quite stressful. So I think think that the, the way forward personally would be that you know some of these deliveries do come early however I challenge that with the point that the landlord that I had um, talked to did say that you know some pubs don't want their deliveries until um, 11 o'clock so there is a part to play with the business on the street as well as the logistics company as well as the local authority that is a, an area that can really be pushed to, to kind of minimise some of that congestion in the peak hours, for sure. I, I don't think that is an issue. It's more getting the right stakeholders in that conversation at the start, which are residents, businesses, the logistics sector, all talking about it and the benefits that that can give for the rest of the day. So um, I hope that kind of answers that point. Right, we're very nearly out of time. I've just one little anecdote from a conversation I had with a very entertaining chap called uh, Rory Sutherland from Ogilvy. He's a behavioural scientist. And he said that uh, one of the supermarket companies, I think it's a, it's either a card or a Waitrose, I think, um, they tried to work out a way of encouraging people to um, take a delivery slot where there's already a vehicle in the, going to be in the neighbourhood during that same hour. And they couldn't work out how to incentivize people monetarily to get them to do that because they thought, well, if, if we then reduce the second person's delivery cost, then the first person's paying more and that's not fair. And they couldn't work out how to do it. So they just decided to make it go green anyway. And so they had it. So the van comes up green on the slot if it's already going to be there in the area. And they won't say what effect that's had in percentage terms as to how many people choose that. Um, but they said you'd be surprised how high it is. It's confidential, so they won't say it. So I think there is a, a genuine um, urge from the consumers to actually do the right thing if they're given the option. And I think that's quite encouraging. Um, right. We are nearly out of time. So what I'd like to do is just go around the panel, please, and just get... Um, uh final comments from each of you please just based on on what we've talked about in the last hour and a half so ben can we start with you just to to sum up um our discussion please yeah no it's been a really good discussion and great to see a really active kind of um and discussion happening in the chat and the q a and you know apologies we couldn't get around to all the questions that have been asked but i think um you know i think for me it's been great to to hear more from from laura and paul on some of their their, their thoughts and insights in this space i think 
Um, it's good to hear that we're generally kind of in agreement that, that, that this is a solvable problem, that more collaboration is needed. So I kind of look forward to working with colleagues more on that. And I think um, the kind of retiming um, is something that we've been thinking about a little bit. And I think it, it's positive to see that coming through as a suggestion a couple of times in in uh, in the discussion and from what law law has um, just said in it too so i think that's something to explore further so um yeah thanks everyone for listening and for the the kind of active discussion cool yeah i, I i'm also uh, yeah some great questions and points have been raised on the chat which we probably haven't had a chance to go through but you know i'm happy to and you to contact me directly if there's anything i can help with at all i think the uh yeah, summary as as Ben's given. I think the there's lots of lessons learned and uh, there's collaboration. I think there's the the direction of travel is absolutely fantastic. I think the two things I point out is that the tech solution and there's lots of them and interoperability and integrations. You know those things don't happen overnight. Albeit that, that I do believe that there's a lot of really good progress being made. The one thing I would say is that just getting us to get to the starting point. Um, of uh, and I was at that uh, with with some of Laura's colleagues earlier this week at a task force looking at this particular area and just getting to that definition of what the curbside is so everybody's absolutely aligned in terms of what our starting point is and then we can start to build on what we're trying to achieve because I heard lots of different definitions all yeah pretty broad, broadly the same but you know it's uh, it's exactly what we're talking about and then we can uh, we can really make some great progress but yeah really enjoyed the session today so thank you. And Laura? Yeah, I think kind of echoing both um, Ben and Paul, I, I think that it's kind of, you can't really segment curbside because it has so much of an impact on everywhere like um, else. And I think one thing I've learned from this is kind of making sure that those kind of impacts on, you know, those who are cycling, walking, business owners, ones who are potentially not normally in that conversation, making sure that they have a place and a, and a voice, um, but also just getting people to communicate again and like share best practice and, and, and work with each other, because actually that's going to help that kind of um, that side of things, but also understanding how we want to monitor it. I think there's a lot of groups in there that that maybe we haven't spoken about today um but accessibility and you know the health of those both at the end destination but also those who are delivering i think that's a big big point that that needs to be looked at in the future to make sure that it's it's good for everyone really fabulous stuff right we're out of time i told you it would fly by uh the hour and a half has gone in the blink of an eye thank you very much to ben to paul and to laura for fascinating thoughts and also to Sunil who sadly couldn't be here with us live but gave us some really interesting insights from local authorities as well. Uh, this whole webinar has been recorded, it will be topped and tailed and ready to be shared very very soon so you can watch bits of it again if you wish or do share with your colleagues as well uh, who will want to find out more about this important issue. Thank you very much for joining us today. We've had a really, really good engagement. As, as we said, I'm sorry that we couldn't get around all the questions and all the comments, but uh, the panellists will try and answer them uh, offline and um, will also uh, be available for you to contact them if you've got any further questions. So thank you very much also to Landor Links for uh, uh, putting the uh, webinar together for us and we'll have another one very soon. Thank you.